Mark Sorensen is, is an engineer by training who over the decades ascended to become an executive leading thousands of engineers and software developers while managing successful businesses within iconic companies. His recent book, A Restaurant in Jaffa, is a fictional cyber thriller with a plausible and frightening storyline of how the security of critical infrastructure can be compromised when technology gets in the hands of individuals who want to do serious harm. The book's timely narrative blends Silicon Valley inside baseball with a lemon tree-like perspective on Middle East tensions to highlight the real threats faced in today's world. Mark Sorensen joins us today in our Massachusetts studios. Mark, Great to see you. Thanks, Thanks so much for coming down here. Thanks, Dave. It's good to see you again. So congrats on the book. As you know, I haven't finished it yet, but I'm, I'm almost finished, and um, it's really quite amazing. What was your motivation to write this book? Well, I mean, it started with, with uh, I've always been a big reader, but I've never been a writer at all. And when I uh, retired from uh, EMC slash Dell, um, I had on my bucket list, I was going to write a book. And, of course, I... I uh, Jumped into it, not knowing what I was getting into. Uh, uh, five years later, this is what I ended up with. But, uh, you know, when they, they say, what are you going to write about? They always say, write what you know. And what I know is the computer industry, uh, technology. And so that became a framework for what I wanted to write about. Um, I think, you know, we, um, uh, we had a lot of uh, engineers uh, that worked for me way back in the day at, in Israel. And... Uh, so I had a familiarity with the Israeli Middle East uh, technology um, world, as well as the political challenges that we're seeing play out over our TVs uh, today. So that became a natural uh, background. So you know, they say, write what you know. So there's a technology, um, computer industry, um, add in a exotic locations like uh, Israel, Cyber terrorism obviously gives you something for conflict, which all books need. Add in a you know uh, an intelligent, attractive young man and an intelligent, equally attractive woman. Stir mix, and this is what you get. Well, it's a, it is a page turner, and it really is a sophisticated mix of how technology and geopolitics, and intrigue and human emotion, with very deep character development. So, I, I just I'm amazed at how were you able to take all this on. Well, um, you know, I'm an outliner, and I wrote a giant outline that began with, here's what happens in the middle, here's what's happening in the beginning, here's at the end. And then I tried to divide it up, uh, and then I just sat down and write, wrote. I mean, you, the very first chapter, our hero is standing in the middle of a, a trade show in Las Vegas. Now, I've stood in that same... <laughs> hallway in Las Vegas. It was Black Hat, right? And then, yeah. Yes, at the Black Hat convention. So again, writing what you know and and restaurant in Jaffa is is certainly, there was a restaurant in Jaffa that one of the first times I ever visited Israel, uh, myself and my head of HR were down there and I was just obviously very uh, moved and impressed by this uh, interesting location and the history that revolved around it. And so, so there off I went. And of course, you know, I, sp I spent a lot of time trying to learn how to how to write, you know, whether it was in classes or books and online classes. In terms of the plot, uh, you know, it was I tried to make sure that I could entertain someone like you, right, who's a deep technical knowledge, broad uh, knowledge of the industry, as well as the 75 year old book club um, people that I spoke to a couple of weeks ago. Um, and these are, you know, I don't say elderly women, but older women, you know, a collection of a dozen of them, and they're not technically sophisticated, okay? <laughs> so I need to make sure, how does this work where you can read it and enjoy it and I'm not talking down to you, and others who can read it, and it's like, I have no idea what he's talking about. So there's a, there's a little bit of a balance there. Well, it's, so much of it resonated with me. I mean, you mixed in Stuxnet. You had a very brief description of Stuxnet. You could have written a whole book on that. You had you, you talked about assembly language, again, resonated with me. <laughs> I remember doing no op commands, wait, telling the system to wait until it read a key so I could write the Pac-Man program. You had C language syntax in there. And, you know, again, very timely things like supply chain hacks that you know, we, we hear about today, but as you say, you, you worked in murder and torture, political intrigue, and, you know, one can actually imagining all this happening in real life, can't yes. they? Well, I mean, I tried to use what I, if I was a criminal, these were, or a terrorist, these were common 
um, soft soft points in uh, anybody's, whether it's the governments, uh, private industries, or what have you, the soft points in their security paradigm that that they have. And you know, listen, you guys are doing a whole uh, event and seminar on cyber resiliency here. It's clear that that most people, most governments, most schools, private industries, they're not resilient yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yet and and so these are all hacks that occurred, easily doable, frankly, and we've seen that some of them um, come true um, since the publication of this book. And I won't go into all of the, those things, but uh, these are nothing some you know rocket science. These are pretty obvious uh, shortcomings that we currently have in the our IT security infrastructure and. and the things that you guys are trying to speak to your audience about. So how do you think governments and organizations should think about today's threat landscape and, and what should be done to sort of fill the gaps that isn't happening in your view? Right. Well, certainly cybersecurity has to be top of mind um, for uh, all uh, IT professionals. And this has evolved, right? At one point in time, we were more worried about uh, disk head crashes. Remember yeah. those? Yeah. Right, a disk head crash. And so our resiliency there is that we had a backup somewhere that we could take, whether it was a big physical disk or mag tape back in the day, and restore it and be back in there, right? So, so that resiliency changes to, in terms of your business, right? Back when I used to run engineering back in digital, right? We said to ourselves, we could probably live with losing a day's worth of work, and we take a backup, and each day we take that, and. Sometimes we take backups when we give them to Iron Mountain, they isolate it somewhere off off site. So just in case we had a fire. So that was your RPO, right? That was <laughs> our RPO back then, right? And uh, so that all people, you know, through backup and data protection techniques have, have done a pretty good job of 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 that, of course. The new the new paradigm is is around cybersecurity and threats from from beyond, but those two technologies are very much adjacent to each other, and those technologies actually play together. While you're looking to prevent something uh, from attacking you and damaging your business, your data, your people, right, you should probably always assume that it might happen someday. It probably will. So if it does, what's your plan, okay? What is your plan? And so this is where I think a lot of folks are just beginning to realize that, you know, we can only put up, you know, the wall so high and so deep, but we should be prepared that someone's going to break in. And once they break in and they damage or steal, or otherwise impair the crown jewels of my business, how am I gonna, what am I going to do about this, right? Do my data protection schemes and the data that I have backed up, am I going to minimize any uh, loss of information? Can I get back up quickly? What if I'm a hospital and healthcare records, right? What if those are modified? They have to be immutable, right? We need to make sure that all of those pieces are put together so you're being both offensive, uh, knowing that you've got to try to, you know, prevent these folks from getting in, but assuming that someday they might, what are you going to do? So hope, kind of hope for best, plan for the worst. So security is such a complicated matter. I wonder if you have a point of view on this. I think a lot of customers that we talk to struggle with the following. They want best of breed technologies. And there's so much new innovation coming out. And so they'll install the, the latest and greatest tool. And as a result, you get this tools creep. You know, at the same time, they're trying to consolidate and simplify their environment. So how should organizations think about, and, and CISOs and SecOps probes, think about balancing that need for the best of breed with this more, the, the greater simplification. Right, and and so today, mo most companies, if you ask them that their, their CIOs and CTOs will tell you that their, their overarching security uh, strategy is rather fragmented, right? And this is because of the chase for the uh, best of breed individual silo of technology, right? But they don't talk to each other, or at least they, they haven't done. And that's certainly a lot of, uh, of uh, IT, uh, professionals are trying to figure out how can I get an umbrella across this that keeps all of these technologies that are doing great job, right? I mean, this is very difficult stuff, right? And sometimes you just can't get it from a single vendor. How can I get an umbrella around here that, that creates policies around this, that has a unified authentication um, and credentialing technologies? And how to, again, as we just talked to, if and when things go south and I have to rebuild my infrastructure, rebuild my business, 
right? How can I do that? It can all of these disparate pieces who don't quite talk together yet fit together. And so you can help by that by saying, hey, I'm not even going to deal with these things. I'm going to put everything in the cloud. Okay, I'm going to let my cloud provider provide most of that. So that's one way and a very viable way but to, uh, for, to do that. But there's always going to be a component on desk, on your things that you still have to worry about. And so the, you'll see more and more people creating, I hate to call it a framework because that's such an overused word, but a security uh, umbrella that can bring these pieces together and give you a more unified um, approach to uh, security. Well, and I think it's true. We do talk about frameworks a lot in, in, in these conversations. I think the hard for, part, part for people is how do they actually operationalize that framework? Framework, you know, it's nice and you get the PowerPoints and the documentation, but then how do you put it into your operations? And one of the things, Mark, that we've been talking about throughout this whole series is the relationship between data protection and cybersecurity. You mentioned mag tape, right? So it used to be this sort of separate thing in, and increasingly, they have become, well, lately they've become an adjacency and they're actually mashing together in yes, a big way. Are. Do you have a point of view yes, on that? Well, I think you're absolutely right that these are adjacent technologies that need to work well together, that have to work well together, uh, but historically have been grown up as individual pieces, right? And everybody had their different flavor of backup or data replication, things of that nature. So these things have to come together and they have to work together because they have to understand if there is a breach somewhere, how and I have to begin to um, uh, depend upon uh, my data protection environment, how do I get that environment? Assuming that you have what you need, right? Assuming you've only you know, allowed, depending on your business, I might be okay with losing an hour of transaction. I may not be able to lose a single transaction, but assuming that your data, your data protection allows for that, how do I get up back and up and running very, very quickly, okay? And uh, so that's been a struggle that when everybody has has put all of the pieces together, right, and it's all sitting there, and how do I recover that, right? How do I get it from A to B and everything from very sophisticated in, uh, incompatibilities to Joe forgot a password, yeah. right, to bring it all together. And so this is that, how those adjacencies work together is how do I make sure that these are working together, I can bring them back together as quickly as possible. Yeah, so the whole conversation you often have with customers, oh, well, how much data do you want to lose? Well, I don't want to lose any data. Well, how big's your budget? Right, there you go. <laughs> so, so as always, it's a trade-off, right? It's a very much a trade-off. And, um, you know, obviously speaking with banks, right, they can't even lose a single transaction, right? They just cannot lose it. Healthcare provider may, it might, it's okay if it takes two days for me to get your CAT scan uh, results to you, but boy, they better be the right ones. They better, boy, I shouldn't have a missing uh, black piece in there. So the different needs and you have to assess your business and then you have to go out there and look for what's the partner, the vendor partner that has the most pieces and, all, and also has a, a thoughtful framework on how these pieces together and they're thinking a little further out, not like how do I get this backup software to talk to this replication software. It's really someone who's putting a, a higher piece of, of the puzzle together. It, and you get things like AI, which brings in privacy. So you want a partner that actually understands those things, at least has a point of view, per perhaps some technology or an ecosystem that can deal with that. I, I want to come back to, you know, Stuxnet really resonated with me ah. because when it happened, it was like a seminal moment in cybersecurity. Right. And when the word got out, it was like, you know, the bad guy's like, wow, that we can really change the game here. And I remember when I was reading about it and studying about Stuxnet, uh, I was struck by, you know, one of the commenter uh, commentators that was in, inside the whole scene said air gaps no big deal because right. of thumb drives you talked about that right. in in your book we right. can get through air gaps no problem and so when you think about things like air gaps and immutability it's part of the strategy but not the whole strategy it changes the thinking around business resilience we see it today in israel where, where you have a number of engineers uh, that are now being called up by the idf to, to go to go fight in a war and they've presumably built in resilience because they're used to being reserves in the in the army, and so they've got you know colleagues that are picking up for them. But that it just changes the way we think about business resilience, doesn't it? It, it really is. I mean, it's just it's just if there's a listen, you know, Willie Sutton said I rob banks because that's where the money is today. The money's all online and IT, and so that's where people are going to go. And then obviously we have is the situation in. In, uh, in the Middle East today is that people have not, not financial motivations, but political motivations that will be leveraging technology. And 
course, we don't know what role technology played in this uh, current situation over there, but I'm sure uh, over time we'll find out, right? And I'm sure we'll, uh, there'll be deep investigations on what happened, what went right, what went wrong, and we'll see where that, where that lands. I mean, incredibly press- impressive piece of work. Again, restaurant in, in Jaffa. I would highly recommend it. You, this is your first book. You never wrote a book before. You said it was on your bucket list. I, I, you shared a presentation that you gave recently with your background, and you took learning to write courses, or maybe you were suggesting them to folks who wanted to, to do this. Um, and, and then you also researched you know, technology, even though you knew technology. Um, but you also brought in religion, which was pretty amazing. You, you gave all these reference materials. You, you talked about your outline that you started with and how you told the story. And then the writing process, you said three to four hours in the morning, four days a week, half to one page a day. And each day you would read what you wrote yesterday. And rewrite it. And rewrite it. <laughs> so this is, you know, months off and on in between drafts when, you know, you say life intervened here, but it was like really a five-year labor of love, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And then, and, and, you know, I did, I did take, take a lot of time off. Uh, in between, uh, in between, say uh, drafts, and I did twelve drafts of this. Wow. Um, but you got to be, you got to be committed. And you know, I was a couple of years into it, and I was like, "Wow, am I ever going to finish this? What am I doing?" And of course, my wife speaks to everybody. Hey, yeah, Mark's writing a book, and of course, it's almost done. A year later, say, "Hey, how's the book coming?" I'm like, uh, uh, uh. "So one day, I said I got to finish this thing," and I and I and I was able to do that. And at some point, you can you can tweak it forever. At some point, you say, "Okay, it's done," and and uh, and it and it's been good. I and mean, listen, uh, these days, because of the changes in the world of publishing, anybody can write a book, right? You can write a book, you can publish it, you can get it out there. Amazon can distribute it to worldwide, and it's all pretty good. And uh, it's just the content in between those pages gets a little difficult to write. Um, but again, very impressive, especially for a fir- first time out. Would you do it again? I'm thinking about it. Uh, I do have an idea. It has, has uh, nothing to do really with, uh, with uh, well, I'm not even going to say it's very different than that, and I do have an idea. I'm noodling it around. Um, at some point in time, I'll say, okay, I'm going to sit down and write it. But, you know, it's not going to take me five years. It might take me two or three, and that's a big commitment. And, uh, but, you know, what else have I have to do? So we'll, we'll, we'll go there. We'll, we'll think about uh, something like that. But this was, this was a pleasure to do, and, and it's been, been received by pretty well. And it's, I guess it's rather ironic uh, that some of the things in there are, are happening in the world around us today. Well, it's it's being very well received. You check out the the reviews on on Amazon. Um, I read mostly nonfiction, but what I loved about this is it was it was authentic. You know, yes, it's fictional, but there was so much in here that was real. Right. So, well, ninety eight percent of of what is in that book is either real, possible, or actually has been done. Very small amount of speculation and thing, and just people just don't know about it. Listen, a lot's going on in the world of cybersecurity that we don't know about because nobody wants to talk about it when they're damaged there, right? So uh, now, to folks like you guys, um, the world is becoming aware of cybersecurity. What the ramifications are not uh, of not paying attention to it is, and you can see some of the results. Well, it, it, we, well, we talk about AI. This is 2023 has definitely been the year of AI. The, the cybersecurity is still the number one most important priority for IT professionals, CIOs, CEOs. It's a boardroom issue. It's a middle out issue. Everybody, it's a, it's a whole house factor. Yeah. And uh, I, I've seen a change in the last few years. I mean, a decade ago, everybody talked about security. Everybody wanted security. Nobody wanted to pay for it. Yeah. It's just like, it's not my budget. I don't want to pay for it. Now, when they see what's happening out there, with their, comp- with their competitors, with their partners, with local governments, school boards, things of that nature. Now it's a, a moving on priority. Now they're spending money on it. And I think you're seeing the vendors respond with more thoughtful, broad-ranging um, cybersecurity and resilience technologies. And government's getting involved. You're seeing executive orders, but you're also seeing better collaboration with, with vendors. I mean, yes. there was a day when people would try to keep their proprietary information. There's still some of that going on. But, but we're seeing data sets being shared, right. certainly within the technology community and, and, and within governments as well. Mark, thanks so much. My we'll pleasure, David. It's always a pleasure to see you. Really great to see you too. Okay, and thank you so much for taking some time and watching Navigating 
the road to cyber resiliency, the summit. Stay tuned for more conversations about the intersection of data protection and cyber. We'll be right back.